Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review at longboxreview.wordpress.com. And today, for this episode, it's going to be a great episode because I have a very special guest back with me on the show, someone who has not been on the show for, I think it's been about a year and a half, Mr. Peter Rios. Hey, Eric. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm so glad, Peter, that you could come back on the show. Hey, happy to be here. Although you said this, this episode is going to be great. That's a lot of pressure. we got to live up to that now. <laughs> Oh, come on. Don't be so modest, Peter. No. Too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> uh, so everyone can find, if you if you don't know Peter, and I can't imagine why not, um, I've mentioned him enough on the show that uh, people should check him out if you're not familiar with him, but you should go check out his website, thedailyrios.com, where he has uh, episodes of his own podcast, The Daily Rios, as well as post to uh, the website, and, and that's where you're getting the, the daily part of the Daily Rios these days, aren't you, Peter? Trying to, yeah. The The second year of, of the first year was uh, a daily podcast, Monday through Friday, anywhere from 10 seconds long to, to an hour long, depending on whatever the topic was. And then in the second year, I wanted to incorporate the daily aspect to, to the website as well. So it didn't have to be a podcast. Yes, every day, Monday through Friday, it could be some other thing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a slow build, and I'm trying to experiment with some things. And, um, uh, and then, of course, during the holidays, things get busy. So with this new year, I thought, all right, I'll just post, you know, something every day. And right now, I'm just backdating a lot of the stuff just to catch up. <laughs> but, uh, and I have to... I have to get one podcast out in January um, because my record there for a while, I think, was like one in November, one in December. So I have to get at least one in January. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm just throwing up stuff on the website. Um, if people see it, great. If not, it it amuses me. And at the end of the day, you know, I do it because I like to do this. So, you know, that's a, that's enough reason for me. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But I, I will, Peter, I have to put in my two cents here, uh, as Ryan Senyo did uh, not too long ago, uh, to call for you to, to put out some more podcasts. Yeah. Talk about, talk about pressure. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And, and I, I have some plans and I have some things that I'm working on, so um, it, it will definitely happen. I'll say that. That's good. You know, the you're you doing that daily, uh, you know, the Monday through Friday podcast that that just impressed the hell out of me that you're able to do that. And I know, like you said, some of them were really short and some of them were longer, but still to come up with stuff every day to put out there. Well, I was I was amazed and um, uh, I felt a little inadequate, shall we say, because I, you know, at best I do like two episodes a month. So. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of it really was just we all sort of think about things during the day, right? You know, because that when I was doing that first year and it, it incorporated everything, not just comics, but theater and my life and my girlfriend, my family, whatever. You know, we all have things that we think about. And in essence, podcasting was exactly that early on in the earliest of stages. It was just, you know what? I had this thought and I'm going to record about it. And if somebody hears it and they listen, great, you know. Um, the whole idea of podcasts um, with specific topics didn't really kick off right away in the early days of podcasting, right? There weren't, uh, you know, you couldn't just find a Star Trek podcast or a gardening podcast. It was really people just talking about everything. Uh, and then eventually, you know, the the whole spe topic specific thing started to kick in. Um, but so that's kind of what I based that first year on. And I, the downside to it though is because I don't have that, um, that schedule, I, I get real lazy now. So I don't want it. To, I don't <laughs> want a podcast, or, or I think of something and I wind up just talking about it on Twitter or to someone else. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. without having those those restrictions of doing it once a day, I'm, I've sort of freed myself, but it's kind of backfired on me a little bit. <laughs> Well, you know, I, you know, the, the freeing yourself comment, uh, I kind of noticed that in, uh, in you talking, I think you talked about it on a specific episode, uh, earlier in the year, early last year, early, or sorry, at some point last year, you were talking about this and I, I could just, mm -hmm. I, I, I could kind of tell in your voice that, that you, 
you seem kind of relieved that you didn't have to do that every day. And did I misread that or? Well, probably by the end there, I was, you know, just trying to come up with some stuff because, uh, it was the middle of the summer at the end of the year. And, and, uh, you know, I was probably distracted by too many other things. Um, and I was glad I did it. And, and it was an interesting challenge and there were some, some really good highs and some lows, you know, but that's, that's always going to be the case, um, when you're just trying to do something, I think, and something creative, I should say. Uh, um, but yeah, by the end of it, I was like, oh, I can't wait. I got to stop this daily thing. <laughs> it's going to be too much. It's hard. It's hard. People who do it. Well, I mean, I, I'm, there's probably people out there that get paid to do it, you know, and they have producers that that are able to give them research material. You know, there's they, they have a they they don't have to worry about editing and blah, blah, blah. blah. Anyway, all to say it, it was a great experiment. And who knows, maybe for the third year, I'll do it again. But right now I'm enjoying my <laughs> my lazy schedule. Well, let's let, let's talk about that for a bit, if you don't mind. So last time we got together and talked, we talked a lot about uh, uh, your theater work, and uh, I think you were—I can't remember—were you starting to do the teaching at that point, or? Yeah, if it was. Um, oh no, no, no! I was already almost a year into the teaching. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what else is going on in, in uh, your life that you you want wanted to talk about here? Oh, well, um, still, still teaching more classes now, um, developed a nice little, uh, tap program at the university I work with. Um, also working on, uh, creating, we've already had one of these, uh, a theater convention. I was talking to the woman that I work with, uh, in the production company that I work with and talking about all these conventions, I go to comic book conventions and thinking, how can we steer that into, uh, something theatrical, something performing arts based. Uh, certainly there are tons of dance competitions, but we wanted to stay away from competitions as a whole and make it more about the education. And we created uh, a weekend intensive training program for seventh through 12th graders. And we had one in November and we have, we're having another one in March here in the greater Philadelphia area. And our eventual plan is to grow it and make it bigger and bigger and go elsewhere in the country and do it. Um, because we have a nice core of teachers from, from local theaters, from Broadway. Um, we have people that have worked uh, in a whole bunch of different universities, schools, um, television, commercials, et cetera, uh, composers. You know, we, we are the, when we looked at the people around us, the, the, the our colleagues that have, we've worked with for years, we found that we have a ton of resources, so we should be using that. And it was a great event for the first year, uh, first program. We had about 100 kids, and it took off, and they're all excited about the next one. So uh, that's kind of the next big venture that I'm working on. Wow. It's it's pretty incredible. It's something that if I was a kid at this uh, and and I was offered a chance to do something like that, I would do everything I could to take it. Uh, because it's something different than just high school drama, which is a great start. But now here's a program that could help you push forward if you want to do something professionally, locally, or if you want to go to college and you need some immediate feedback and, and help on, on college auditions. So uh, it's, a, it's a fairly exciting adventure, and, and it's starting small like, like all things, and uh, hopefully it'll take off in the next couple of years. Wow, that's 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 pretty cool. I'm always busy. I'm just too busy. I got too much going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you find time in your day to do everything that you 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 talk about that you do, like on Twitter and, and the posts that you make? And I, I I can't imagine having the schedule that you do. Well, I mean, I don't have a family, right? An immediate family, so that that. I know that takes up a lot of time with people who do, you know, have wives, husbands, uh, partners, kids, you know, that, that takes up a good chunk, you know, uh, I have a girlfriend, but we don't live together, you know, so it, I have time. I don't sleep much. And, and there are days, believe me, there are days when I do nothing but sit there on YouTube and watch cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I get distracted like the best of them. Uh, and I just powered through, Finally, after the third attempt, I finally powered through and finished 
Stephen King's The Stand, uh, which is over fourteen hundred pages. And in the, I think about a week and a half ago, I just uh, or a week ago, uh, I just was determined to finish it, and I read about six to seven hundred pages in a couple days. And I know that's not like a major feat, but I just. I said I had to do this. I have to sit here. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to finish this book. <laughs> well, and you talk about, too, how you like to uh, – you want you want to get caught up. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch this back to comics a little bit here now. Um, mm-hmm. How you, how you want to get caught up on DC stuff and some, or maybe some specific things that are more recent. But you like to go back to the past – and read about oh, oh you you talked about some of the the Thanos stuff and um, you know yeah. and Marvel and how you want to go all the way back to you know some early Avengers stuff and 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 the Starlin stuff with Thanos and 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 work your way up to the present. Yeah, you know, I was on um, uh, a podcast called the Sunday Comics Podcast, which is part of uh, Donnie Salvo uh, is the main host on that, and uh, I think it's part of. Um, um, I think it's part of the Taylor network, I think, uh, I think, or the, uh, so it's, it's a mix of podcasts, um, by Daryl Taylor and Donnie Salvo and all these other guys. So anyway, um, they were talking about, we were talking about Marvel now. And I, I said that I said, you know, they asked if I was reading infinity, but up to that point, I, I, I wasn't caught up yet. And I said how, yeah, I, I made the mistake of going, oh, Infinity by Jonathan Hickman. Hmm, maybe I should read, reread and finish reading his Fantastic Four run because some of those elements might take place in Infinity. Oh, wait, but he also wrote the Dark Reign Fantastic Four miniseries that predates his Fantastic Four run. So let me read that. Well, then why don't I just read everything Hickman's done at Marvel well, wait a minute. Infinity's about Thanos. I've read some Th- Thanos stuff. It's been a while. Why don't I go back and read, you know, the Infinity Gauntlet or go all, all the way back and read the stuff I've... Uh, it, it's a sickness, Eric. It's just a sickness. <laughs> I can't stop. I, it's because I want to put all this stuff together in my brain so I know where it all makes sense. You know, I want to I want to I want to be my own personal Wikipedia page but not as dry, you know, I want it, I want it to make sense. Uh, and I want the connections, even if they're deliberate or not, I want those connections in my brain. So yeah, that's why I get, I can never catch up because I keep going backwards and that that's a, it's a, it's a curse. Well, like you said, I, I how, yeah. How could you ever get caught up on things? You're starting to uh, sound a little bit like Murd, I think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I usually always try to keep, uh, and so does Murder, but I, I try to keep an, an awareness at least. If I haven't read everything, at least there's a light awareness of what's going on currently. I don't know the specifics, um, but I know like a ge- I could, you know, general thoughts of things. Um, there's just so much out there, you know, and it's just so much out there and it's all good. And, you know, thankfully the stuff we're talking about today is isolated <laughs> you know we can just sort of talk about it in itself yeah it's not wrapped up in other stuff and um uh, you know i'm not saying that i dislike when it's wrapped up in other stuff i do like it but it's also nice to just kind of read something and and go great it's only five issues we got to read perfect and so, yeah, like you said, we're going to be talking about, uh, and I didn't mention this at the beginning of the show. Um, oh well, uh, we're going to talk about, but we're going to talk about Lazarus and Rachel Rising. But before I we we move on to that, Peter, you mentioned before about the convention that you helped uh, right in, uh, get started. But I wanted to ask you about, you know, Comic Cons. Uh, do you have any plans of doing any Comic Cons this year? Yeah, I hope to. I, I, I'm feeling a need. I didn't do many in 2013, if any at all. I can't remember. Um, and I'm just feeling like I, I want to get back in that environment again. Um, what what if, what conventions do you go? You, I know you go to Emerald City when you can. Are there any others you've been to? Well, there there is a uh, something even more local uh, called the Spokane Comic Con. It's in Spokane, Washington, in eastern Washington. Um, it's not at all a big con it's it's a quite a very small con uh but it, but it you know they they have uh, they have 
local people and they brought in some folks from that, that have done some stuff for DC and Dark Horse in the past. So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of nice, uh, neat to go there and see that. And uh, actually, in February of 2014, uh, a local comic, a couple local comic book shops that are in my area are putting together a teeny tiny little con that they're calling PalooseCon because uh, the area that I'm from is called the Palouse. And so it's a it's a one day event that uh, I probably will be going to because it's the first one. You know, it's in my own backyard, so why not? But other than that, you know, Emerald City is it for me. I don't I'm not able to get out to the other cons that are around the country or even you know somewhat in my my region. So, but I will be going to Emerald City this year. It was kind of a last minute thing. We're actually going to be taking our granddaughters to see The Lion King, the uh, the traveling Broadway show version that is coming nice. to Seattle. So it's it's there at the same time as Emerald City. So we thought, what the hell, let's, let's take them too. Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's a nice little theater town in, in uh, community in, in Seattle. But and, and when you go to those cons, I mean, don't you just walk in and go, ah, oh, this is awesome. Even if it's a small one, you know, you got creators and you got – comics that you know you can buy or um i'm not a big toy collector but even i'll walk through those aisles just to look you know and admire and whatever uh it's it's fun right it's a fun thing that if you have a certain uh enjoyment in a hobby and that hobby is suddenly thrown all around you i'm sure everybody knows that feeling you know it's just a great feeling to walk into something like that yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, that's exactly how I felt the the first year that I went to Emerald City. It was it was like, and and Kirby Crackle has a song about this, right? Um, I think it's called "Coming Home" or or "Home" or something like that. But it felt like I was coming home, you know. And and it, it was it was an incredible, amazing experience. And and uh, if anybody out there who's listening has never been to a Comic Con and you have an opportunity, you know, I highly in- encourage you to to try it out. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. And like you said, the, like you said, the, the, the shopping opportunities and really now, Peter, that's, that's why I like to go to the cons, um, is mm-hmm. to, to find the stuff that fills in, you know, the, the gaps in my collection and, and to discover, you know, new and interesting things as well. Right. Right. And Emerald city is a great convention, a great, what I, what I look at as sort of like a mid-sized, but pushing its way to be a larger convention if if not almost even like a national convention because the the artist lists there is amazing and it has been for a number of years Mm -hmm. Um, top top a-list creators go there a great indie section mid-list creators um it's a, a wonderful shopping and it's run by comic fans so um that show is just great and you know i think some people get the idea that some conventions, they're probably just, you know, flea market, uh, uh, um, glorified, glorified flea markets. And some of them are. But if I can buy comics, 10 cents a piece, 25 cents, 50 cents a dollar, I'm there. You know, I'll, I'll do that. And then if it has all the other stuff, artists and creators and like-minded attendees and fun panels, that's just a bonus. And uh, um, as someone who has sold a ton of comics out of his collection. I, I find a comfort in knowing that I can go to any convention and probably find a, a mini series or part of a series that I sold and go, you know what? It's always going to be out there. I can read it whenever I want just by going to a convention. Maybe people don't have the luxury to do that or uh, they're too far or they don't have the time. I understand that. And that's what the internet's for. But it's really great to, you know, the one we have in Philly is a Wizard World show, and it's not the greatest, but if I want to go shopping, it's a perfect place to shop because then I just hop on the subway and drop my books off at my apartment, you know, so I, I, I love conventions for that aspect. So, Peter, do you, uh, like you said, you, you, you sell off stuff from your collection, but do you ever go back and, and after you've sold something and realize, hey, I, I actually really I really want that. And and then is that, that is that when you go to to like the conventions and and reacquire those things or or you just do you not just do that? No, oh, no, I I I've done it. I've done it a bunch of times. I think um in the 80s there was this I think it was the late 80s. Uh there was this four issue Amethyst miniseries 
so Amethyst, Princess of uh, uh, of Gemworld, the she was recently featured last year in the Sword of Sorcery book that DC put out. Um, in the 80s, she she was in a 12 issue maxi series. Then she had her own series for about 16 issues, and then uh, Keith Giffen got his hands on the character because in the late 80s, Keith, Keith Giffen was everywhere, and he was like he was like the golden boy for DC at that time. He got his hands on Amethyst for four issues and twisted her into the whole Lords of Order and Lords of Chaos with Dr. Fate and all that. And it was drawn by an artist uh, named Esteban Maroto. And it's four issues. Esteban Maroto also did the Atlantis Chronicles seven issues with Peter David that really fleshed out the whole backstory for Aquaman. So... It was beautiful artwork, four issues. I remember selling it on eBay, went and bought the four issues again, sold again on eBay, <laughs> went and bought the four issues again. I, I think I've probably owned about three or four sets of that miniseries at one point or another. So what is it? I don't know why I do it. Go ahead. So what? So why did you do that? Why Why acquire it, sell it, reacquire it, sell it? What, what caused you to, to go down that path? Part of it's because I, I like that character a lot, and I like that miniseries. Um, that miniseries is how. Did you read the JSA James Robinson Jeff Johns series in the early two thousands? Yes. Uh, and that's one that had like Steven Sadowski on the art for a while. It brought um, Hawkman back. Well, in the first four issues, there was a character called Dark Lord. And Dark Lord would eventually become the Legion of Superheroes villain known as Mordru. Right. Well, the origin of Dark Lord as a Lord of Chaos agent takes place in that four-issue Amethyst miniseries. And that's where you actually learn the origins of where Mordru comes from and... um, you know, what his future will will be, his destiny. So it's kind of fairly important to to that character and to the Legion concept prior to Flashpoint. So I always feel like I need to own it. (laughs) Yeah, and, and the other reason is to wrap it back up into conventions. I always see it at conventions. I tend to always come across that Amethyst four-issue miniseries, and I go, oh, there it is again. I might as well buy it. It's 50 cents a piece. I'll buy it. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, but Peter, why get rid of it in the first place? <laughs> you move as much as I used to move. I don't move so much anymore, but I used to move a lot. When you have to move 20-plus long boxes, it gets to be real tiring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you... I'm not that strong, so I can carry one at a time. I can try to carry two at a time, but God. long boxes are, they're kind of awkward, you know? They're, yeah. And then you, that's heavy. That's, heavy, you know, 600 books you're trying to carry out into a car. So I get to a point where I, I think to myself, I got to get rid of this. I can't keep doing this. <laughs> so are you reading, uh, are you getting and reading more digital comics these days or no? No, um, for some reason, even though I sometimes yell about how many press releases they still they, they, they drop into my email, um, I still get um, the review copies from Image. Oh, you know, it's all digital stuff, and you can't download it. Or I guess, I guess maybe you can download it. I, I never tried. I get them from Boom Studios as well, from because I used to be on those lists when I used to produce uh, Comic Geek Speak. So, you know, they don't ever take you off those lists, so I, so I still get those stuff. So that kind of stuff I'll read uh, online. It's still not my favorite, but I'll read it. Um, and then my local comic shop is really good about um, if I pick up stuff uh, and then I come back like a week or two later and go, hey, can I trade this in for something else? You know, because they know that I do a lot of stuff online and podcasting and, and I try to help them out with promotions and they're just good friends. So I'm able to read a lot. It's almost like they're like my local library in, in a kind of way. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 
don't get me wrong. I spend a lot of money there <laughs> between them and, and between them and DZBS. I still spend money, but you know, every now and then I'm like, you know what? I, I, I want to read this, but I really don't want to buy it on a continual basis. You know, I just kind of want to read maybe like the first couple of issues and then, you know, bring them back. And I, I don't stick them with, uh, I don't wait like months so that they're stuck with like these back issues that they can't sell, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, I just do that because it just that way I can read. It's almost it's almost as if they should just hire me because they wouldn't have to pay me. I would just sit there and read all day. But <laughs> uh, have you ever worked in a comic book shop? No, but um, I always I told this comic geeks the store that a lot of us uh, grew up at, at was called Golden Eagle in Reading, PA, and it was run by a man named way uh, about five years now and his first well the store that i uh used to go to i don't know if it was his first one and as a kid me and my friends at that time we were in junior high i think we used to go and help him pull books i i wasn't an employee it was just something that he did uh you know he let us do and then he would give us a free poster or a couple free comics, you know, that day. And uh, we were like his little child labor. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure if someone came by and said, hey, you can't do that. Those are kids. But ah, whatever. We <laughs> love. So, no, I never really worked there on the retail side, but uh, that was about the closest I came. Yeah. Would you want to work in a comic store? Do you think nowadays do you think it's. Uh, well, okay. So uh, I actually did many years ago did apply to work at one of the local comic shops here, and the one of the co-owners of the shop also owned a local bookstore, uh, bookstore, as well. It was it was an indie bookstore here in town, and he saw my my resume and said, "No, I want him to work at the bookstore." So. Uh, I, I never got to work in the comic shop, which is probably a good thing because uh, I became friends with a uh, a guy that works at a, another comic shop in Spokane called the Comic Book Shop. And just over the years, we've talked and, and interacted, and, and uh, I ask him, you know, every once in a while, you know, about the business side of comics. And I, I let it slip one day that you know I wanted to, you know, he should hire me or something. And he's like, No, you don't. You don't want to work here. <laughs> And I, I, I think now that I, you know, I don't really need to work at a comic book shop. I'll just enjoy right. them. <laughs> right. And it's not, and some of it's not even about the customer. Some of it, you know, is, some of it can be the horror stories from Diamond, you know, of, of, uh, of, of them shorting books or sending your package to the wrong place, or you try to order some back issue for a customer, a trade or whatever. And, you know Diamond has it in stock, but they don't sell it unless 10 other uh, comic stores also back order it, you know, or something. It's something weird like that. You know, I, I've heard of indie creators who say Diamond has our books. They just don't they just don't sell them through back orders because it has to be reach a certain quota or something like that. And, you know, I mean, if just for that end of it, it seems like a, a, just a headache. Yeah, I've also entertained the thought of, you know, over the years that, hey, I can open open up my own comic book shop, but then, you know, better better thoughts prevail, I guess, and I come to my senses. <laughs> Only if I hit the lottery. If I hit the lottery, yeah. then I'll open the store. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Of course, I'd have to play the lottery first. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, uh, unless you have uh, anything else that you'd like to bring up, yeah, uh, two things. I'll, I'll save the second one for later, but um, I wanted to ask how, uh, you know, I know the last time I was on, you said your daughter was involved in the arts, and I just wanted to know how was that going? Is, uh, you know, she's still in school? Is it, she's still on track with that? Oh, yeah. She, in fact, uh, this is her final semester. She actually is going to make make it through college in four years, which was incredible. Um, and she'll Great. be getting her uh, her BFA in oh gosh I was going to say theater arts but that's not right <laughs> musical theater 
is is the actual thing. Uh, but but a lot of the focus uh, of her schooling, and this has been partially her choice, uh, was is in in the vocal aspects of it. So she's she's developed into uh, quite the the you know me being her dad aside. Um, <laughs> She's she's developed into you know a really really beautiful and uh, strong singer, and and, yeah. and and like I said, it's not just me because her professors are telling her how you know how good she is and how how much she's grown over these last four years. And so That's now, she, yeah, so now she's she's looking at you know the other side uh, after she graduates and what she's going to do, and she also happens to have a boyfriend now, and they're pretty serious, yay! And uh, uh, <laughs> so they're you know they're 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 feeling the waters and you know what's going to happen and all that stuff that comes with you know icky relationships. And not right. n- not that right. theirs is icky. I'm just <laughs> I'm just being a dad here. <laughs> He's actually a pretty good guy. <laughs> it's a tricky time when you're just about ready to be sent off into the world. Um, colleges, especially for this program or this uh, this degree, can can be great about the training aspect, and I think they could do better at developing awareness of exactly the options after college something very hands-on and 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 I don't even mean about finding work but how about budgeting you know because you're basically going out into the world as a freelance artist unless you land some really great careers Um, and there's a a lot of things about that that sometimes colleges forget to talk about so um, there's a, a, a definite growth period after leaving school with this kind of degree um, where you just really have to be open to everything, open to um, what it is you may want to do, um, open to working in the field, but maybe not necessarily in what you're strong at. Um, uh, other options of, of you know, looking at where you live and, and what's going on around you and, and um yeah, so it's it's it definitely is a tricky time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good that you mentioned that too. Uh, Brittany actually is uh, contemplating those very things that you mentioned, and I, and I agree with you. I don't think that the the school here, while while I do love the school, it's where I got my master's degree from, uh, the University of Idaho. The this 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 particular program, I don't think that they have done. Uh, a good enough job preparing her for, you know, post-college stuff. Right. So I, I worry, uh, and she does too. And, uh, I think right now her plan is to, um, once her boyfriend graduates, they both plan to go to the, probably the Portland area, uh, f- because she's heard from her, her professors and other people that they brought in, uh, to uh, into classes and and to interact with the students, you know, people that actually have worked in theater and on TV and movies and stuff. That uh, the Portland area is pretty good, uh, pretty receptive, I should say, as far as uh, new actors and 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 other people wanting to get into that kind of business. So she's she's looking at that looking at that right now. That's great. That's great. And I mean, uh, I also well. Uh, as an aside, Portland has a, a really comics community. So if she does move there, you can move, you can visit. And <laughs> apparently, there's a lot of comic cartoon uh, artists there. Creators. Yeah, yeah. So that that's good. Oh yeah, that reminds me that that yeah. Portland is going to. I mean, not going to. They, they've done this already. But uh, Emerald City Comic Con has partnered with the Rose City Comic Con in September. That's coming up in September, and so uh, they're doing. I can't remember if it's their second or third show this year coming up. So I'll, I plan to go to that as well. So it'd be really interesting to see the difference between Emerald City and uh, the Rose City one. That's just getting started. Cool. cool. Okay, shall we Shall we uh, move on to talk about some comics? Let's do it. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, Peter and I will be discussing uh, Lazarus, 
uh, by Greg Rucka, Michael Lark, and uh, Santi Arcus, I believe. And then Rachel Rising by Mr. Terry Moore. And so uh, Peter and I probably will be discussing particular details of these comics. Uh, so you are warned as far as spoilers go. Uh, so let's get started with uh, Lazarus first, Peter. So I, you, this is something that is uh, recent for you, isn't it, as far as getting, uh, getting to read this? Uh, if I remember correctly, you said something on Twitter about this. Right, yeah. Um, it, it was sort of brought to my attention in a, in a one, two, three kind of punch kind of thing <laughs> in a weird way. Um, when it first came out, and the first issue came out last year, about June of last year, I think. Um, and there's only been five issues to date. So the first issue came out and my local retailer said, hey, you should check it out. It's pretty good. And I knew the creative team, Greg Rucka, I knew Michael Lark. Um, and I had a, for some reason, I had a preconceived notion of what it was about. And I thought it skewed to the uh, crime genre, for lack of a better phrase. So I don't necessarily go out of my way to read those kind of comics. So I was like, nah, I think I'll pass. It's all right. Um, I didn't know much about it at all. And then uh, the next time it sort of popped in my brain was when you, when we were talking about what to talk about on this show. And you asked if I had read it. And... Uh, I had, I said no. And at that time, you know, we weren't going to do it. And, but, but that at least made me go, let me just at least read what the first issue was about. And then I read the, I just read this super quick solicitation. Uh, and it still didn't sort of grab me, but at least it like put a drop in my brain. And then I went to a party with a bunch of comic people and the, uh, one guy is a comic retailer, and he said, you should be reading Lazarus. And he started talking more about it in detail. And I said, okay, enough's enough. <laughs> Obviously, I need to read this. <laughs> I got, I got, you know, two, two retailers and a podcaster's, a podcaster whose opinion I, I appreciate and, and listen to. So I got to read this. And that's when I emailed you. And I said, okay, let's do it. I'm going to read this. And, and that's, that's my history um, so don't prejudge books because you never know. That's and right. I really just prejudged it because I thought, you know, I thought Greg Rucka, I know he did Gotham Central. I thought it was going to be this procedural procedural thing. And I was like, eh, I don't really want to read that. But glad I did. So how would you describe this book now? And have you have you read all five issues that have come out so far? Yep. I'm, I'm all caught up. Um, how would you describe it? Uh you know, okay, so these are the kind of thoughts that pop into my brain sometimes that really probably make no sense, but but it might help. It almost feels like, um, yeah, it's kind of weird to say this, but for one fleeting moment, I thought, wow, this sort of reminds me of Dune. Did you ever read Dune? Uh, no, but I watched the movie. Okay, so you have you have an understanding then, you know the whole uh, he, he who uh, whatever the quote is about, you know if you own the spice, you own everything or whatever. I don't know, it's something like right. that, right? You, yeah. you control everything, and and there's these families, and um, you know this this is this is like a real world take of anything that any kind of geeky show like Game of Thrones, where a bunch of family, it's it's like Dynasty even, it's a bunch of families. <laughs> who can, who control everything, right? They control the spice, if you want to say that. They control agri- agriculture and they control um, power. They've taken power from government because they are the, they're not even the 1%. They're the 0.00001% of the wealthiest of the wealthy. And they've divided up the world into fiefdoms almost, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. they, they, they call their workers serfs and they call the common people waste. And each house has one Lazarus or one, um, 
I don't know if you bodyguard for the lack of a better word, mm-hmm. that they um, are artificially created, and we are following one of these Lazarus um, that belongs to a family that controls the majority of uh, America is what I sort of s- s- can take from the book. Um, so that that's like the I don't know a really loose description of the book. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that's pretty good. I I didn't think of the 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 Dune aspect of it, but yeah, that's that that's a good analogy, I think. Yeah, you know, because he he says in in the back, um, if you read the text pages and the single issues, uh, he talks about how he wanted something really sci-fi, but hard sci-fi, not laser guns and and things like that, but so- science fiction where. You know, humanity is in a predicament, and and how do you get out of that? And um, if you flip through the book casually, you may not get that aspect at all because there there are no ray guns and there are no floating cars. Uh, the the tech is actually very low key, so it probably just looks like just a regular dystopian America, but. Um, there are some sci-fi elements to it, and I, I love sci-fi, and I like the way it's approaching it. So, um, for that aspect, of, you know, it, it starts to it starts to sink in. Yeah, and and the the whole, like you said, that sci-fi aspect of being low-key, that's very true. Um, uh, until they start getting into, and they really haven't done this yet, but but they've kind of teased a little bit about about how. Uh, Forever, who is the the the, the lead Lazarus? Uh, you know the the character who we are following through the story. Um, you know how how she was created and how she is maintained, and that we get a lot of that. You know because she as you know she's they're they're called Lazarus for a reason because Lazarus was the guy uh, uh, who came back from the dead in 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 the Bible story, and so. The very first issue, the very first scene, is uh, showing us forever as she, as we as we come to know her or Eve. They 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 nickname her Eve. Uh, I just call her forever because I like that name. Um, uh, she she gets shot up by these these looters in in this one facility, and lo- you know she's dead. She looks like she's dead, but she comes back. You know she repairs. So it's kind of like um, oh gosh, what's uh, there's 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 a uh, a valiant comic. Bloodshot. It's, it, it reminded me of that because here, okay. he's a guy that is uh, he has all these nanobots in his body that that repairs the damage that's done to him, and so it's a little bit like that. Um, and so, but we see we see uh, Forever's physician James, uh, and that's how the, the 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 comic opens. Number one. Uh, they're having a conversation after the fact of what we're seeing, you know, after, after the events that, that we are being shown in those first few pages. And, and so, but he's, he's talking to her and trying to get her talk to him about her feelings about this situation while he's monitoring her and, you know, looking at the, the various reports. And we see that throughout the issues where um, her sister, and we should talk about the whole sibling thing, her sister Beth mm-hmm. is also helping uh, – James, the physician, monitor uh, uh, Forever's vitals and all that kind of stuff. And and Beth seems to be, uh, f- she f- feels protective in a way about Forever. And, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But so do you do you want to talk about the the sibling aspect of and just the the the, the Carlisle family in general? Yeah, let let me uh, say some things about the Lazarus thing too. So if there's anybody who hasn't read it. Um, the other interesting thing about the Lazarus, at least in terms of Forever's case, is that she doesn't know what she is. Um, they have told her that she is a daughter of the Carlisle family, and there are three daughters and two sons in, in this family. Um, but she doesn't know what she is. She, doesn't, she just assumes she's a biological daughter of the head of the family. And she's just been trained to be the master assassin or the heavy or whatever you want to look at it. So that um, that uh, sense of identity is something that she plays with, um, or I should say something that Greg Rucka is playing with, especially with the big reveal at the end of four. Or not, it's not a reveal, but the little, the new little direction he takes it at the end of issue four. Mm-hmm. Um, 
where someone emails her and says, uh, your father is not your father. Um, he's not your father. This is not your family. So all of a sudden, you know, that's now throwing doubt into her brain. So the Lazarus uh, concept, which was shared amongst the families, um, I don't It's going to be interesting to see if some of them do know their identities of who they really are. Is it just forever that thinks that she's part of the family biologically and we don't know really what she is just yet. She certainly looks biological, but um, and there's a lot of Greg Rucka fills in a lot of the backstory in the text pages with a lot of real world scientific things that are going on with stem cells and other kind of cells and creating livers and doing all this kind of stuff. You know, he he's showing that even though he's reading about uh, writing about uh, I think we're set in what 2064 I think is one of the dates I saw um, even though he's writing about the future the future is now so again that whole sci-fi aspect uh, the Asimov Isaac Asimov I robot thing you know it feels like it's playing here heavily and I like that I like that about the Lazarus concept yeah and and so uh, we have like I said we have uh, the <laughs> The Carlisle family, which is uh, uh, Forever's family, and and I'm glad you brought that up about her, um, uh, you know, the her being the daughter, but not really the daughter. And that's what I was alluding to with Beth was that uh, one of the brothers, one of the younger brothers, Jonah, uh, who who gets into a bit of a predicament in as we go along in the story, um, says something uh, to the effect of Forever, you know, says it out loud that that she's not even. Um, Malcolm, who is the father, her, his, uh, his real daughter, and Beth right. just goes a little crazy on 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 her brother, and <laughs> grabs a knife and is threatening to slice him up if he if he doesn't shut up. <laughs> well, he and he also said so. The the siblings are uh, uh, Jonah and and Joanna. I think her name is yes. Uh, yeah, they're twins, and then Beth and Steve. Beth works with. Um, James, the scientist, like you took, like you said, who, who is uh, in charge of monitoring everything that goes on with the Lazarus. Um, Steve, we don't really know too much about, except he's he's the eldest, I think, of of, of all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that fight scene, um, you know, they were all called to come to Malcolm because uh, someone broke into. A Carlisle um, harvesting station, you know, uh, agricultural station, and um, Jonah is saying, "Well, it, it's 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 one of our rival families. It's it's the uh, Mores down from I think that was the name from down in Mexico. He's pushing for this war between his family, and and you you, you sort of learn later that you know was this fabricated to try to start a war or 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 something." And so the father, Malcolm, calls all his kids in a very Shakespearean kind of way, and, and most of them go, and um, he's, he's getting a sense of what his kids are up to in the kingdom. So that scene you're talking about, where the other siblings are told to go wait in the kitchen, Jonah also says something about, hey, you know, if we lose forever, you, can, you and James can just, you know, knock boots and make another one so i don't know how literal to take that you know um but it, it, did he just mean you can create one in another sort of frankenstein way you can create one is he is he poking fun at beth for having a romantic relationship with james um or maybe she just likes james and jonah knows this so there was there was something else to that conversation that hasn't come out yet that i'll be interested to find out what that means Exactly. So that's one of the things I love about this title is that that Rucka, you know, gives you these little tidbits, these little nuggets of of in, bits of information, and there's so much weight to those little bits that we haven't seen yet, uh, or at right. least that's that's how I'm taking it. Um, but it's just that's what I love this comic because there's the the characters just come forth almost fully realized. You know, the first time that you meet them. And you're only you're really only seeing a certain aspect of them within that particular scene. But there's the, just the way that they the they're shown, uh, the way that the artist shows them, the way that the, the words that Ruck is putting in their mouths, 
um, they seem like really that, or they seem like realized characters, uh, instead of just, you know, ciphers for getting the, the, the plot moving. And, and I really appreciate right. that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a strength to Michael Lark, the artist and, and his team. And I mean, he's taking on a lot of the art, but in some of the later issues, there's other names listed that I assume helped out with inking or coloring or something like that. But, um, his style um lends itself to this sort of gritty um you 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 just feel you feel like the atmosphere itself is just full of smoke and and just dirty and um it, it would fit right along next to um i don't know something like sons of anarchy or or some tv show that just just is dirty you know <laughs> um but and so it can get a little you have to sort of get used to uh his characters and his and his art style because you know he has detail but he's he's really more interested i think in mood and setting and um and and it has some real world visuals to it uh what i mean by this is you know lazarus forever she's mostly shown with a ponytail and then when she takes her ponytail out i i kind of stop and go oh wait oh right that's forever you know so he's not so detailed that um um they're making that everybody has a very distinct look so he gives you visual cues you know jonah has long hair beth has beth has blonde hair but she usually keeps it up and she wears glasses whereas joanna the twin of Jonah ha- also has blonde hair, but she she normally lets it loose. So it's kind of tricky, you know. If he starts making Beth and Joanna look alike, it's not going to help us as re- readers because his style isn't quite that defined purposely. Because he's he's you know it's it, the the mood of the book is really important and the coloring. Um, so those visual cues really help because you could get a, I think I found I I got a little bit lost every now and then. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the 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 as far as the art goes, it's yeah, it's very much uh, a sense of feeling as opposed to a distinctive look. So that we're yeah. it, you know it it so it helps bolster the the, the mood that we're getting uh, to to enhance the story. Uh, at least I I think so. And and yeah, it's yeah, it's it's it is dirty. I I, I like that that uh, description of it. But but it fits the world perfectly. You know the way that this oh, yeah. the dystopian future that we have is, you know, you do not want to be waste. That's for sure. But even even the family, the members of the family, have to live in this world. They may they may despise it like Jonah does, um, uh, but you know the, they have to deal with it in in various ways. And so it it, it affects and infects everyone around. Uh, you know, everyone in, involved in, in in the story. Right. It's. You know, you could almost transplant this story back to like the Dark Ages, and it's as if princes and princesses are walking through the common muck, and and you know when when members of the Carlisle, well, okay, so Jonah is Jonah and Joanna are basically in charge with like the Los Angeles area, right? Yeah, I think that's where they 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 hang their hat, and as they're driving through. Uh, there's one scene where Forever says, you know, why haven't you built up these communities? And he says, why should we bother? It's the, it's the waste. They're not part of the family. Um, they live off of, you know, whatever it is that we provide. And, you know, they're they're walking, they're driving through these sh- uh, shanty towns in Hollywood. You see the Hollywood sign, it's all broken apart. And there's, it's like those images in South America where there's just shack after shack after shack on the side of a a hill and and that's what they're driving through and and it sort of made me think you know that could be a prince and their knight in horse-drawn carriages going through the darkest of darkest villages where people are dying dying of cholera and whatever else you know i mean it really felt um felt like that and that sense really helps to push the notion that Greg Rucker is playing with, as I said, you know, we, we look at it now as the 1% versus the 99%, but he's looking at it as the 0.00001% that, 
versus the 99.9999999999%. And it's alive. I mean, even before I read the text pages, I I, I thought, well, clearly this is, uh, you know, he, he's tying this into the real world goings on of, of, you know, I guess what they're calling this, the new gilded age, you know, the, the gap between the wealthiest of wealthy and the poorest of poor is getting uh, bigger and bigger. And, and he's playing around with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, so I want to just comment a little bit about what you said about the, the, you know, like the middle age aspect of it. Uh, and then you, 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 you pair that with the, the dichotomy that is um, the, the, the technology of this, of this future place. And so in issue number five, they, they, they bring in this, this, uh, family in Montana, these farmers or ranchers. And so they're, they're in danger of being flooded. And so they use this comm unit, you know, this basically this, this computer portal to contact, uh, some people involved with the family, you know, who are managing that area or whatever. And to, to say, you know, we need assistance. If you don't help us, um, you know, the, the river's going to flood and we're going to lose everything, lose the farm, lose their home. And, and they just, you know, they end up leaving because it, otherwise they'll die. They come back the next morning and the only thing standing where their house once was is this, this computer portal with the message saying, yes, we've, we've looked over your contract and you're good. We'll have, we'll have something out there in the morning. And it's obviously it's too late. Um, right. but it's just, and here, you know, it's just sitting there among all this destruction and, you know, I think Rucka and, and, uh, the artists are definitely poking us in the eye saying, look at this, look at this situation, you know, look, look at the haves versus the have nots and these poor have nots have it really bad. Yeah. And it's not preachy. I don't want people to come away and think, oh, well, I don't want to read that because it's too preachy, you know, depending on whatever side of the political aisle they fall on. You know, it's not preachy at all. It and and it's not necessarily always the main point of his story. You know, the book is called Lazarus. It's not called, uh, you know, point zero 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 one percent. So, you know, this the story and the development, you know, I imagine if you if you like, I don't know, if you like things like Blade Runner or Philip K. Dick or I don't know, I mean, all of that, all of that is here. It's just really under the surface. And, and it, they chose to do that both in style and in art um, um, because there's, uh, you know, he says he has a number of years that he wants to go on this book. And this is only the first five issues. So. There's a lot to set up, and um, he does it well. In fact, excuse me, I think, I almost think um, after I read it, the five issues, I thought it almost jumped too quickly into the family drama and into um, uh, the idea of her questioning her identity. Um, because when you read those text pages, uh, in the back issue, in the back of the issue for the first like three or four issues, there's this ongoing timeline going on that is catching you up to issue one. Basically, it's setting the groundwork for everything that happened before issue one, how these families took over the country, uh, how they how the families created a treaty amongst themselves so they wouldn't always be at war, how the Lazarus program came about. It's a fast. I love it. I love that timeline. I even think it's on some degree for me, it's, it, that's more of the story that I want, I want to read, I think. <laughs> um, because, you know, we're, we're set into this world and all of a sudden we're into conflict already. And I, I understand, you know, you sort of have to do that in this day and age. You got to grab your readers early, you know, because it's a hard sell. You're, you're up against a lot of competition. Um, so I almost think we jumped into the conflict a little too early. This would have, for me, I wonder what could have happened if this maybe was a second story or a third story. You know, I don't, I don't, did you feel any of that? Does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah, definitely. I, I felt the same way, uh, especially the, the whole reveal that, or someone, whoever it is that's contacting forever, you know, that, that little bit, I thought that came really fast. The, the bit with Jonah, um, uh, 
setting this war up and then running away to 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 safety. Uh, yeah, it seemed really rushed. But like like you said, it, you know, uh, it seems to me that uh, Rucka is just trying to get you know some of the best bits, if you will, out there to get people interested and reading and stay with it. And hopefully, he'll be able to to keep those people around uh, and and continue the story and maybe fill in a lot of the stuff that we're getting in the in those those back matter pages. Because right, it's, it's right. Th- this story, I think, is is very rich in the world that he's created, and you can tell so many different aspects of these stories. We don't even, don't even have to follow forever in every issue. There's just so many interesting characters and the backstories to them. Uh, we can even jump generations, and I, I think I would be very interested in seeing you know the early days of, of Malcolm Carlyle and how he built up his fortune and and what happened with the catastrophe and. Uh, uh, and everything that goes along with that, we can even follow the other the other Lazaruses uh, involved. Right. I mean, we we do we do get uh, exposed to another Lazarus. This is the Moray Lazarus. Um, what's his name? Um, Joaquim. Joaquim, yeah. And and so you know you 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 meet that other Lazarus, and he's a little different from from forever, I think. Uh, he, he talks specifically about the implants that he has, and so he can't eat particular kinds of food. I think uh, it was a mango or something. I can't remember what it was. And and uh, in what's it, to the at the end of issue three, uh, Jonah and Joanna have, or try to um, uh, blame the, the Moray family for, for killing the two Lazarus with a missile that they, they shoot from, I think it was a helicopter, but, uh, of course that doesn't work. It'd be a short series if, if that, if that indeed worked. Uh, but, but, uh, so, uh, Joaquim and forever fight, fight these guys and, and, uh, report back of course. But there's, there's this, uh, so again, there's this great scene between those two when forever goes to the Moray family to deliver a message from her father and she and Malcolm or she and Joaquim, uh, have this discussion, and they have this connection. And, and and at first, it's just the fact that they're both Lazarus and what that means. Although we, we're not, you know, we don't know exactly what that means. We can kind of guess based on what we've seen. But it's very clear that they feel that no one else understands what it is to be them. Uh, right, right. And, and just, just the whole idea of it just there's just so many things to talk about about this. Uh, just the whole idea of the Lazarus and the way that they're they're genetically engineered and they're they're brought up to to be, you know, to to, to take from uh, kind of the Game of Thrones storyline, you know, the hand of the king, in a way uh, that they 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 follow the orders, even though it's it's family, it's kind of weird that way. Uh, but it, but I enjoy that aspect. But so you know. Forever is obligated to do certain things that she does not want to do, and I don't know if that's because she is different in particular. So, like in the first issue, she has to uh, she ends up killing this old man who who says he's the one he's he's the traitor uh, uh, in the midst of that that uh, the Harvest One farming facility that you mentioned earlier, and she she knows that he did not do it. But he's protecting his daughter and the rest of the people there because it was. I think it was. I think it was revealed eventually that it was Jonah that that did this. Um, but he's protecting all these people, and she has a conscience. And 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 uh, James and I can't remember who he was talking to. Maybe Beth uh, at the moment. But um, they 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 talk about forever and how she is asking questions and that's a bad thing. Right, and, right. and so you, I have to wonder to tie it back into Joaquim, you know, does, does he have these same kinds of thoughts or is it just her? And it's just, like I said, I keep saying this, but there's just the, the characters are so rich. This, the, the world is so rich or the potential of, of the world is so rich that there's just so much that we could get into character wise and story wise. And this, like I said, this thing could go on for quite a while. If, if we, let it right by supporting the book yeah um what you said about joaquin uh and his implants uh when forever is done meeting the head of the moray family in mexico so she goes she goes down to mexico at her own father's request 
to um, meet with the head of the Moray family um, because her father knows that his son that his son Jonah is is in cahoots with the Moray family, and uh, he he goes down and she, forever goes down, and she relays a message and says, "Look, you know, you're going to give us this, this, and this." And we will give you this, this, and this, and in exchange, you will no longer have contact with Jonah, or else there will be a war and you will not win it. And the head of the Moray family agrees, and that's what sets off um, Jonah uh, and jo Joanna to come up with a scheme to try to kill forever before she can get back, uh, because they know, they know that they're caught. In fact, Joanna knows that she's caught so bad that she actually makes it look like it was all Jonah's plan. And that makes Jonah uh, go and flee, flee that side of the country. And he goes to the east, apparently. So far, that's what we know. Um, but in that, in that um, missile strike, like you said, uh, we see Joaquin come out of it and his flesh is gone. And you see the implants underneath and he's got the metal implants. Um, and uh, it's an interesting thing because they know they're different. I guess they don't know how diff or how they're able to keep coming back from the dead. And certainly Joaquin is playing around with it by, by putting all these implants on himself. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, I don't, you don't know how much they know about themselves and that'll be an interesting reveal. And then that scene that you mentioned in issue one, where she's going to kill the old man, and execute him. Um, and she says, you know, I, you know, you're innocent. I know you're innocent. Why are you doing this? And and he says, you know, I forget what his answer is, but forever says, oh, I'll tell your daughter that I love you. And he says to her, believe me, uh, she already she already knows that I love her. Trust me, Miss Carlisle, she knows. Earlier on in the book, James and we're talking or James and someone else are talking about. I think it's Jonah that you have to show these Lazarus that you love them. You have to make sure that you keep putting in them that they're part of the family or something could happen. And there's that look in her eye when she said, when she hears a father say, trust me, my daughter knows that I love her almost as if he's saying, does your, do you know that your father loves you? And it's a tiny little moment, like you said, and it's way in issue one, but it's, already starting the whole identity thing going and i thought that was a neat little moment and, and then yeah and then and then it's uh expanded upon in issue number five when we get that flashback where forever is you know much younger and she's being trained by uh, a woman in, in combat and and uh, father shows up and she she runs up to him they haven't seen each other in five months uh since her birthday i think she i don't know she, peter she looks to me like she's maybe nine ten ish maybe right in right. that in that issue and so she she runs up to him and gives him a hug and and is very excited and and he's very stoic and and short with her and says is that a way to, to greet your father and she's like i'm sorry sir and 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 uh, and she you know he had brought the family sword which uh she, you know she, he asks her do you know what this is and she says yeah it's the sword you promised me and he's like no that's the sword that you must earn that's the family sword you must earn and then uh, causes uh, or tells her to defeat her trainer, and then the sword is hers. And of course, she doesn't um, do that. And then he's very disappointed at her, and then says something about um, he's embarrassed that she's part of the family because of her failure. And so, yeah, when when yeah, like you said at the at the, at the beginning of the of the series, you know, they're they're counseling Jonah to show emotion to to show this connection to forever and yet the father is incapable of showing that and and every interaction that we see between the father and forever is always very businesslike right. even though he calls her daughter and and refers to her as family he certainly does not show it right did you read uh the prelude do you know do you know about the prelude to lazarus no there's apparently on his website, and I only came across it today. I should have forwarded it to you. There's like a really short prelude on his website, and it's a conversation between James and Malcolm about that very thing, about about loving your daughter. It doesn't go really deep. It's just it sets up that whole thing about, you know, you have to do this. You have to show that you love her. 
um, I have to send it to you. Uh, it 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 just echoes on on everything we're talking about, and and it made me think by the end of these five issues and and that short little prelude, um, you know, it's one of the problems I have with uh, not problems, but uh, with some TV shows where everybody is bad and everybody's looking out for themselves and there's no good goodness in 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 any to be found anywhere right and some of some sometimes that gets a little too one note for me um by the end of this i i wrote a note i said who's on her side in this family the the beth I don't really think beth is because there she's she said a couple times um, you know james i think says well, you know, she thinks of you as a sister and, and Beth says, oh, you do you really think she's capable of that? You know, I, I think Beth is a little jealous. Joanna certainly wanted her dead. Jonah wants her dead. Steve, we don't know too much about. The father is very cold to her. There is a mother, but we haven't seen her yet. So there's a, a little interesting, like, I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, but in that one of the first issues or the second issue, I think it was second issue, the father says to forever, you know, I have I have all these kids and yet you're the only one that is really uh, like a true child to me. I forget what his ex exact words were. Actually, Peter, um, I, I think let me, hold on. Let me look at that because I re, when I reread yeah. that I because I thought the same thing. And but when I reread it, it seemed like he he does say that there's only one child that's basically worth a damn in the family. I think the implication was that we're she's supposed to think he's referring to her, but I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Okay. Which, which, which I thought was a very interesting piece of manipulation on his part. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, well, and again, it all goes back to this question. Nobody seems like they're on her side, and that's a little frustrating because, um, and I get it, that's the point. You know, she's, if I had to speculate, you know, obviously it feels like, at some point, she may go up against the family, maybe all the Lazarus, maybe they all will rise up against their own family. Um, because her was very, when she was in Los Angeles, she she could tell that the waste were being uh, downtrodden, you know, and that it feels like she has more of a conscience than her own family does. And that's very much in the style of this kind of story, where there's usually one outsider that knows, can see everything that's going on. Or, or an individual who's stuck in the middle, and it's up to them to, you know, rise above it. Look at the Hunger Games, right? You mm -hmm. know, the, this character from a very poor uh, district, and and she's a, she she causes the fire that uh, brings about all the revolt. You know, so to me, it feels a little too heavy on that side of it, which um, which made that scene between her and Joaquin really nice. Because here's another Lazarus that we thought they maybe would just fight each other, but they didn't. They're actually flirting with each other. And it, it was a nice little break, uh, and it was nice to see Forever smile. But Well, yeah, and, and also uh, when they are both coming back to Carlisle territory, you know, because Joaquim is, is escorting her there, you know, he indicates to her, let's pull over. And he, she's like, well, is, there, is, there, is there something wrong? He's like, no, let's— Let's basically let's let's watch the sunset and and she you know that's a, that again like you said that yeah that's exactly it was a nice little uh, moment between them and also to to um, to contrast to the I guess the the dark reality that is the rest of that world so right. I I do wonder though um, so speaking of you know who's on her side. Uh, we, so we have the mysterious messenger telling her, you know, your family's not your family. And and then there's, I, I have to wonder, since they were featured so prevalently in issue five, that family in Montana, you know, because it wasn't just, you know, because the, the artist um, is, is, you know, you see a lot of stuff in the background and how things are. And so you, you get you get a real good sense of what this world is like just by what's going on in the panels in the background. But they spent... Mm -hmm. I don't know what four, five, maybe six pages in issue five on that family in Montana. So I have to wonder is, is you know what's going on with that? Uh, how much of a uh, part of the story are they going to to play? As uh, of course, especially uh, to forever or with forever, or with Jonah. I wondered if maybe Jonah was going to wind up in that part of town because they found his his vehicle down in Mississippi. 
was it Mississippi or was it just against the Mississippi River? I forget. I where. think it, yeah. So I'm not, I'd have to I'd have to look again because that could you know the Mississippi is certainly long enough that <laughs> he, he could be anywhere along the Mississippi. So I didn't know. I yeah you know that, and I think he also just wanted to show Greg Rucker wanted to show another part of the world and what was going on and and uh, the first four issues are its own story arc and then five kicks off a new one. So we're we're sort of left hanging right now because there hasn't been any new issue yet. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what becomes of that family and. It was also interesting to see the exchange when they were when they were on the different sides of the of the river. Um, the other side belonged to the other family, the Bittner Hawk family, um, uh, and Hawk used to actually be with Carlisle or something like that, according to the timeline mm-hmm. in the back. And um, clearly, that side of the, the the country isn't as strong as the Carlisle family and. You know, you sort of wonder, wow, what's going on there? You know, and the Moray family is down in Mexico. But when they listed how many people were in that particular town anyway, it was uh, one family member, 22 serfs and 12,000 plus waste, which, uh, you know, wasn't a lot compared to some of the ones that were going on in the West Coast, where it was like, you know, three million waste or something like that. So the the bring up of the world it, i i would love to see a map of the world yeah i was thinking the exact uh, same thing just a breakdown would be cool and that adds to that whole sci-fi element or that fantasy element the you know the dividing up a world and and uh who owns what and where are you going to go and um there was a book by frank miller and dave gibbons called martha washington mm-hmm the character was Martha Washington. I forget what the rest of the title was. And they did the same thing where, where the country was divided up into different sections because of radiation or something like that. Um, so I, I have to imagine if you're a fan of any of that kind of stuff that we've been talking about outside of this book or 2000 AD or something like that, you might, you might really enjoy this. Yeah. And, and so just one last thing, I think, unless you have more to, to talk about Peter, the, I, in issue number five, there's uh, there's the, there's the uh, interaction with Forever and the people on the other side of the river with the Bittner Hawk uh, coalition, mm-hmm. where you know they're they're taunting each other back. Well, I guess it's more them taunting Forever, but then she turns around and one of the guys shoots her in the back, and and her <laughs> her guys, the Carlisle military guys, are like, okay, let's. They're about ready to, go to you know, charge the river and take them out, which, of course, would start a war. And she's like, no, you know, stand down. And then has this 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 great monologue uh, where basically, you know, one of you cowards shot me in the back. However, and, and this means war, if, if it was an order, if, you know, if someone told you to do this, that means our families go to war. However, if if you acted alone and you guys do something about it, then she considers the matter settled. And so then there's this great, there's this three panel scene where there's these guys just kind of stand there and they all start looking at this one guy and he's like, Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm one of you. <laughs> and then, and then there's, there's gunfire in the next panel showing, showing forever and, and the captain of the guard there. And, uh, and they kill him. It's just, it's amazing. The power that she has over you know, another family because of this threat of, of war constantly between these, these, mm-hmm. these factions. And so, yeah, right. it's, it's, you know, it's very much, uh, it, you, you mentioned something about the, you know, the, the, the middle ages and, and referenced game of Thrones, you know, it's very much that, and Shakespearean for that matter. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, it's very Shakespearean and, and, you know, kingdoms and, and, and fiefdoms and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's really, right. really cool stuff. Yeah. And and even to bring it into not uh, to bring it to something a little more current. I mean, it's Godfather, right? It's it's the Godfather movies. It's, yeah. It's families coming together and capos and all the you know I don't know the terminologies, but it's it's the families all have you know similar structures and and some are more powerful than the other and they control the world and you don't want to mess with this family. It's it's all of that stuff, and yet it's all surfacey. And they're not uh, not surfacey. It's it kind of plays underneath the story, which is nice. It doesn't necessarily hit you over the head with it all the time. It's it's there underneath, 
through characterization and interaction, uh, dialogue, with some really, um, some of the artwork when, when you get some close up of faces and eyes. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's everything that you and the two comic retailers that told me when they said to read it, I should have trusted all your instincts because it, it, it is quality stuff. And this was a comic that I remember uh, going back to Comic Cons in Emerald City when they announced it. I'm not sure if Emerald City was the the first announcement of this book, but it was the first time I'd heard of it. And so I was mm-hmm. in I was in the image panel there uh, a couple of years ago, and 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 they brought up that image, which is the 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 cover image of this book. And I think I think Rucka was there talking about it. I'm pretty sure he was. And uh, so he was he was giving you know giving us the 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 elevator pitch uh for the comic and and that was one of the ones you know and i wrote down all the books that 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 uh, image and other companies were talking about that were coming out and that's the only one that i can remember specifically out of all the stuff uh for some reason you know that image and his description just stuck with me and so when it finally came out i was like yes so finally get to read the story yeah I mean, he's, he's, there's no question. Greg Rucker is a really great writer. I haven't read nearly enough of his stuff. I've probably read more of his superhero stuff than anything else. Um, but you know, he's also a novelist as well. So mm-hmm. he, he has good pacing and he knows to develop characters. And, and if he's putting some characters out there and hiding other ones, he's probably doing it for a reason. Um, you know, and, and, and it'll come out later. So I look forward to the to the journey. As do I. Uh, so, Peter, anything else about Lazarus we should touch on before we move on? Yeah, before we go. Uh, so, talk. Looking back at Lazarus, our talk on Lazarus and those on those text pages and that timeline that um, was was that they were spitting out at the back on the back there, some interesting factoids about you know uh, everything that led up to Lazarus number one. I was reminded of that same usage in one of our favorite Legion eras, the five years later Legion stuff, Uh, where a lot of the text pages in the back were all about things leading up to the the economic crisis. I mean, it's it's interesting how reflective that is to, to, to Lazarus. And if you ever owned the Legion source book, for the role-playing games called, I think it was a 2995. It was the year, the Legion of Superheroes 2995 source book. It gave a huge backdrop to, to that five years later Legion stuff. Um, uh, it gave timelines. It gave uh, some correspondence stuff that they created for that game, uh, for that you know role-playing. Ver- I never role-played, but I bought the book anyway because it was so stuffed with information. And it just reminded me of all that stuff. And I know you have a fondness for that era. And um, we talked about possibly taking a look at that in a podcast venture together. So uh, I just wanted to, I think that would be neat because I think it's it's a wealth of information. Um, I think you and I would do a great job on, on the sort of, you know, going through it issue by issue and just saying, hey, that'd be great. So I know I emailed you and I said at some point we should get together and do that. I have no idea when, but uh, (laughs) I'm still I still want to try to read as much Legion prior to that before uh, we, you know, we would do such a thing. But I just wanted to like just again, just to you know sort of put it out there that I haven't forgotten about it. It's um, but I think it would be a fascinating way to, to look at that era. Oh yeah, that uh, that would be awesome. That, that's uh, you. You and I have talked about this uh, through Twitter and email before, but um, the five year later Legion is one of my favorite runs of that entire series. Although, and this is probably a good thing because uh, to be talking about this, um, I've been reading some stuff uh, from people that, uh, well, I've been reading some stuff uh, from people online, basically, kind of. Um, what do I want to say here? Uh, not being very favorable towards the five year uh, later Legion run, and and mm-hmm. I, I want to put a stop to that, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I, I it deserves uh, it deserves some accolades for what it accomplished. Yeah, I mean it was it was ahead of its time in terms of the way Keith Giffen told the storytelling. Um, you know, if you were a fan of Fifty Two, 
you know, this nine year, this five years later, Legion stuff came out in 1989, I think was the first issue. I mean, or 1990 or somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it was dense and yeah, you know, you probably did have to know some stuff about Legion, but to which I say, look, you either sink or swim, you know, I mean, some <laughs> comics, not all comics have to be dumbed down uh, or or averaged out so that everybody can understand them. I mean, they they can, you know, if you're willing to try some new things, and it was very popular at the time it, and controversial. But I also know a lot of creators who also really like it mm-hmm. and 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 think it was a very uh, smart book and a very deep book. And um, I've always been meaning to read it again. I've read it a bunch of times, but I want to, it's been a number of years and I want to look back on it again. And, uh, you know, it, it does take a lot of foreknowledge. So, which is why I'm trying to read earlier Legion stuff before it, especially the stuff that I haven't read there. There are, there are some Legion stories I haven't read. So, I look forward to uh, hopefully we're able to do that and and um, uh, connecting that too. you know, once I get the tower back up, I know you're a big new Teen Titans fan. So uh, if I ever get a Skype set up, we'll have to switch roles and, and I'll bring you on that show and we can talk some Titan stuff. I, excellent. I would love that. Cool. OK, I'm going to stop the episode right there because the conversation with Peter continues on in a future episode where we discuss Rachel Rising. So come back for that. But before I go, I want to remind everyone that uh, Travis and I will be doing the Long Box Review Best of 2013 episode here very soon. The plan is to do this on February 9th. It's a Sunday, Sunday morning, and we'll be doing it on Google Hangouts. If you would like to submit your nominees for the following categories, you may do so at uh, by sending email to longboxreview at gmail.com. That'd probably be the easiest way to do that. And here are the categories. I would like to know what your favorite ongoing comic is, your favorite limited series, your favorite single issue of a title, one shot, or a trade, either either one of those your favorite artist, and this can be a penciler, inker, colorist, however you define artist is fine. Favorite writer, favorite cover, favorite new character, and this could be a hero, villain, or any anything in between that. Your favorite moment in, in the comics that came out in 2013. And also, you can submit nominees for your most missed Sleeper Surprise Hit, Cancelled Before It's Time, and then finally, Most Anticipated for 2014. Again, you can send those nominations to longboxreview at gmail.com, and I would love to hear from you. That way I can uh, read these on the air live come Sunday, February 9th. If you'd like to leave feedback on this particular episode with Peter and our discussion about Lazarus, you can email me at longboxreview at gmail.com, leave voicemail at 208-953-1841. Longbox Review is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network, and you can also find the Longbox Review podcast on Stitcher. Thanks for listening.